Church of Lexington. Good to see you online. It's good to be here, and even though we are not together physically, um, we are together in spirit, and we are trusting the Spirit of God to just continue this time of worship and to bring us to a place of submission and understanding of the Word of God. Let's pray. God, I just thank you for your Word. I thank you for this opportunity, and I just pray that uh, you just speak to our hearts, give us encouragement, give us strength, and give us understanding, and give us conviction that we act on in your name. Amen. All right, we are going to be in in Ephesians chapter 4 this morning, Ephesians chapter 4, and while you're getting there, I don't know how many of you are grandparents, any of you grandparents, yeah, so grandparents have something that they just can't resist, and it's spoiling the grandkids, right? Um, Cindy and I, my wife, we joke about this on a regular basis because we cannot go into any store without stopping by the baby and children's section and picking something out. These grandkids, they get stuff for Christmas, for Easter, for birthdays, for Fourth of July, for Halloween, for just because it just happens to be a long time since we sent something, and they get these care packages all the time. We just love to spoil the kids. And I am not really much better. So I bought one of those balance bikes for our granddaughter. And I looked online. I got it from Amazon. It's a bike where basically there are no pedals. You just sit on the seat and you, you walk it. And she's not able to pedal just yet. And so I, got, I looked at this balance bike. I looked at them on Amazon. And the pink one was $20 more. Okay? Now, as a parent, I would say, and I have two daughters, I would say, 20 bucks for pink? Forget it. They're getting the blue one. And, but as a grandparent, I am saying, shoot, who cares? Pink is what this girl deserves, and we're getting it no matter the price. And we just can't help ourselves in spoiling our grandkids. And this is kind of what this passage addresses in us in our struggle to just do what comes naturally. It's always easier for us to just do what comes naturally, what our emotions tell us to do. And so this is what this passage really is talking about. God understands this. And we're going to read the whole passage of Scripture, the whole chapter. We could break this down into, a lot, into several sermons, but I just want you to get kind of an overview of what Paul is saying here. And he starts, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle, and be patient, bearing with one another in love, and make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond and peace. There is one body and one Spirit, and just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father over all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and he gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lowly, lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will, grow to the, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. And from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. 
And having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him with accordance of the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each, must of, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not get the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands so they may have something to share with those in need. But do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only for what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, and along with every form of malice, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. It's kind of a long passage, but basically what Paul is saying here is that Jesus is Lord over everything, and he expects us to live like he is Lord over us. Now this week we are beginning a series on God's expectations. Okay, so this is, this is a series that's going to go on for several weeks, and each pastor is going to talk about what God expects. For God has loved us, and he has sacrificed for us, and he has given us many gifts and, and, and has been very good to us. And it, there's an expectation that comes with this salvation. There's an expectation that comes with the gift of being in the family of God. And so that's what this series is about, is about expectations, God's expectation. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is saying Jesus is Lord over everything, right? We have him as over all and in all, and Jesus who is the head in two, in two of the verses here that kind of are separated in the two parts of this passage. God here is, expects us to live like he is Lord over us. So the basic view of where we are here in Ephesians, just really brief, is that in Ephesians chapter 1, God has given us every spiritual blessing. So he has given us every spiritual blessing. In Ephesians chapter 2, he has given us membership in his family. In Ephesians chapter 3, there's, uh, Paul goes back and forth in typical Pauline fashion to confuse us. But basically, Paul's prayer is that we know the love of God. So we have the gift of every blessing, the gift of membership in his family, and the gift of his love. And in light of what he has done, he expects us then to live as he is Lord over us. He expects us, as verse 1 says, to live a life worthy of this calling to be in the family of God. And here in this passage, there are two ways of living that honor God's calling on us and reflect his lordship over us. As, member of God's, as members of God's family and in submission to his authority, God expects us to live for the good of his community. We are expected to live for the good of God's community. This is in verses 1 through 16. He says, I want you to be this way. I want you to be humble. I want you to be gentle. I want you to be patient. I want you to do these things for the sake of unity because we are serving one God, one spirit, one baptism, one Lord. We're all serving this one God. And for the sake of unity, we are asked to be humble and gentle and patient. This unity does not mean agreement in everything. But it means that we are all focused on the same goal, submitted to Christ and submitted to leadership and working together towards that goal. 
I was uh, a part of a church in the Illinois area and in the Chicagoland area, and um, we, it came up. This church was struggling. We were very much like this church, um, a lot of building debt, um, taking a lot of our money, and um, we had a very nice, very large building. Um, we were larger congregation, four or 500 people, um, and... <clears throat> But we still struggled to meet the bills every day. And we had this opportunity. So this was the beginning, this was a long time ago, beginning of the cell phone era. And um, we had this opportunity. AT&T said, we will put, we just want to put a cell phone tower off here in the corner of your property. Property we aren't using, property we won't use. And we'll pay you. I forget what it was, something like four grand, five grand a month, just to let it sit there. And I'm going, yes, <laughs> I'll take it. My board, on the other hand, said no. AT&T supports all these things that we don't believe in. So I actually took them out of our meeting room into our sanctuary where we had... Um, where we had these shadow boxes of all the missionaries we supported. And there were parties and things like this, and there were, there were, there were um, pictures of donations that we had received. So this, like one, one, one group in Africa had gotten a pizza party. There, of course, is a big Pizza Hut logo plastered over here. And there are other things with other logos where corporations had greatly, had graciously um, uh, uh, sent money for this, and they supported the same things that AT&T does. And I said, look, let's take the money. God is giving it to us. And uh, I was outvoted, and we moved forward without having the cell tower. Now, it's not important that, that we disagreed. We didn't have to have 100% unanimity. We decided as a group that we would be humble and we would submit to each other and we would pray and we made a decision and we proceeded in unity and not everyone agreed. And that is what God expects for us to be humble and gentle and patient. And that's why, um, and that, and that, and because we need to go forward in unity because we serve one God and one spirit. And then Paul tells us, he says, but each one in verse 7 has been given a grace as Christ apportioned it. Now we need to kind of back up in chapter 3, Paul defines what grace is, okay? So for Paul, grace is what they call, theologians call a technical term. So it's a, that means it's a term that means something that we wouldn't normally associate it with. So when Paul says we have been given a grace, he's, talking, he's not talking about grace like we think of grace, the grace of God. What he is talking about is a gift. God has given each one of us a gift. And he's defined this in chapter 3 as a gift um, so that we know that this is what he's talking about. And Paul does this often with this term grace. It means a gift. His gift in, in chapter 3, it's his gift to preach to the Gentiles. Um, so Paul has given each one of us a, great, a gift. Okay, He expects us to pursue the development of this gift. And so what he has done is he has given us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to teach us to use our gift and to equip us to use our gift so that we move forward in unity, we move forward in maturity, we move forward in stability. Do you see, as we are involved in the body of Christ under the leadership of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, we are unified, we are mature, we're also stable. We are not blown here and there from every wind of teaching. And so every little thing that we hear or we see online, we, we're not swayed by it without having some foundation of the Word of God behind it. We are sustained, we are able to sustain ourselves and grow as we grow together and we feed ourselves in the body of Christ. And this is what God wants for us and expects for us. He expects us to live for the good of His community, 
to be humble and gentle and patient, to identify our gift and to use it to be under authority and move forward in unity so that we are mature and that we are stable and we sustain and we grow each other. And this requires community. So I went, um, <clears throat> I was a music pastor at a church and um, and this was, a, this was a church that had two services. The first service was, um, was, the, uh, was the traditional service, and the second service was the contemporary service, and that's the service that I was in charge of, and I was supposed to introduce or continue to move this church forward into contemporary worship. And I noticed that um, there was also a youth pastor and a, and a senior pastor. And I noticed that um, in the first service, uh, there, were about, we had, there were about 35 in the first service. We had about 60 or 70 in the second service. In the first service, there was nobody there. The pastor would show up just before it was time to preach and leave. And... Um, and I just thought that that was not a good way for us to move forward in unity. And so um, I, I was not a favorite among the first service people. And I decided I would begin to just attend first service. And so I started to attend first service every week. And I can, I'll never forget the first time I showed up to first service. I showed up to service. I went behind the stage and I put my guitar down and I came out. And the organist said, Dave, what are you doing here? <laughs> nice welcome, right? <laughs> but that's the way they felt about me. But I started attending. The other staff started attending first service. And it created a better sense of unity within the congregation because we were involved together. We were all proceeding down the same path in unity at this point. And, um, and so even though the two services were still different, at least the staff was saying, we value both services. We're moving forward on the same path together. So for us to be able to move forward, we need to find our gift and use it. We need to attend church and church activities. There, there just is no biblical view of God's community being separated from God's community. We're in America, we're a lot more individualistic, but God's community is a community, and God addresses the community as much as he addresses the individual in Scripture. And there just is no biblical idea of Christianity without the community of God. We need to change church, we need to attend activities, we need to attend the community Wednesday night things. Um, when, right now, it's just the Bible study. It's not a community Wednesday night, so right now, that's not it. But we will, in the fall, have several choices. We need to attend those. We need, um, we need to attend the baptisms um, just to support those who are making a commitment to Christ and say, we're all a part of the same family. We're all moving together. We all serve the same God. And this first step of obedience for you is awesome. And we support you. We need to attend to church members in need. We are so focused in the American church about social service to others. And it's certainly important. But it doesn't take long to figure out that God's first concern is our local congregation. First, we need to take care of each other first. And so this is how we live for God's community and for the good of his community. So Jesus is Lord over everything, and he expects us to live like he is Lord over us. And so we can live, he expects us to live for the good of God's community, and he also expects us to live for the good of others in verses 17 through 32. And he describes this thing. He says, um, he says uh, so, um, so verse 17, so I insist on this. In the Lord, you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. And uh, I think, um, you know, a lot of us are Gentiles. But the point is not really whether we're Gentiles or Jews. But the point is we don't live 
the way we used to live before we knew Christ. You see, before Christ, we were thinking wrong. We were coming to the wrong conclusions. We were insensitive. We indulged ourselves. We were impure, and we are greedy. Isn't it, isn't it interesting how we just get this greedy tacked on to the end? This, this impurity, we automatically think of sexual impurity or, or, um, or you know, some sort of lying or something like that, and then also greedy. Um, but we're self-indulgent is the point. We are focused on ourselves before Christ, and we are to take off these attitudes, these behaviors and values, and we were to put on the, beha- the attitudes, behaviors, and values that are um, focused on God and on others. And in this passage, then, he's, he defines what we take off by what we put on. And this is a way that God addresses us a lot of ways. We have a tendency as humans to focus on what's wrong and then work on what's wrong so it's fixed. But God's approach to things is, no, you focus on me and on what is right, and that is where your mind and your heart are set, and then you will begin to be able to leave behind what is wrong. That's why when we are tempted, James tells us not to, not to kick Satan and, leave and run. He says, turn to him first and then resist Satan. So the focus is always on God first. And then Paul highlights this in this list of what we are to put, we, what are we do to take off is defined by what we are to put on. So he says falsehood. Instead of falsehood, we are to be truthful. We are to speak truthfully to one another. Instead of being angry at people and holding grudges and other things like that, we are to carry with us a spirit of reconciliation. Instead of robbing and stealing from people, we are to be a a productive member of the community, and not only be a productive member of the community, we are to be generous with our production. So not only are we producing, but we are giving away what we are producing to those in need. We are to take off worthless talk and instead add speech that is helpful. And then he groups bitterness, rage, anger, and um, brawling, and slander, and and malice And he groups them together and says, instead, be kind and compassionate and forgiving, just as God forgave you. And so as we live for the good of others, we are taking on Christ-like character. We are taking off our old character, and we are putting on Christ-like character. So, I wasn't sure how I was going to do this uh, holding a microphone, um, but so just think of it in terms of jackets. I'll use my shirt. We are to take off, I'm not going to take off my shirt completely, but we're to take off, everyone said amen, thank you, we didn't need to see that. We are to take off our old nature and put on our Christian nature, the nature that Christ has given us. So now... I have this Christian nature, which in Revelation we, we identify as white robes as well as other places. And so I have a white t-shirt, and um, we have our nature. This nature, this green shirt needs to come off, and the white shirt needs to be put on. And so Paul is telling us, that we need to live for the good of others by putting on the character of Christ. So there's a good way for us to identify where we are in this. I mean, some of us, some people are more apt to wear the white shirt on top, not have the green shirt. 
But this is what Paul is addressing. Paul is addressing the fact that it's easy for us to have our old nature over the top of our Christian nature. So you can see a little bit of it here, right? But our old nature is still here. And this is exactly what this is addressing. And so I would encourage you to kind of take stock. Because God is Lord over everything. And he expects us to live like he is Lord over us. He expects us to live for the good of his community, and he expects us to live for the good of others. And he expects us to do this by putting on his nature. So if we take stock and we, we make a list, we make a list of everything in our lives, everything we do, everything we're involved in, from the relaxation to watching TV to going to work and everything like that, and then we start, we cross off everything that has to do directly with God and his family. So I have my list of everything I do in my life. And I cross off everything that has to do with God and his family. Like, okay, I'm going to cross off study. I'm going to cross off prayer. I'm going to cross off church attendance. I'm going to cross off activities. I'm going to cross off service to others. I'm going to cross off the money I give to church. I'm going to cross off the money I give to others. What's left? Have you crossed off anything? Or do you have a list of 18 and have crossed off two things because you don't participate in any of the others? God has been so good to us. He's given us his love. He's made us a part of his family. He's given us every blessing. These gifts don't come without expectation of following through on family responsibilities. Just like we do with our children, right? We give them chores to do because they are part of the family. My youngest daughter wanted us to give them allowance. She said, Papa, I want you, why don't you give us an allowance? I think we should get an allowance. I said, no. I said, right now I provide for you. I'll give you what you need, and I'll give you a lot of things you want. But you have responsibilities in this family. And so as a part of being a part of this family and getting the blessings as a part of this family, you have certain responsibilities. She had chores, things she had to do. God expects the same from us. He expects us to live for the good of his community and to live for the good of others, to take on his character. So let's pray. And as we have this last time of worship, I want to encourage you to just take stock of what God is doing, what you're doing, This time of COVID has changed our lives. This time of COVID has changed our lives and we we need to get back on track. We need to find our place in God's community again.
God, I just ask that you help us to be honest with ourselves. And thank you for your word and that your gift to us is love and family membership and blessing. Help us to live lives that are worthy of those gifts. Help us to hear your word and apply it to our lives. Help us to be full of your spirit and to be repentant and to be proactive. You are the King of Kings and you are worthy of this from us and we desire to serve and love you. Help us to build our lives around who you are. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for all you've done for us. We thank you that you underwent the trials of life here, Jesus, and were crucified for our sins, bearing them all on you so that we wouldn't have to. We bless your name, Jesus. And we ask, if anybody here in this room does not know you as Lord and Savior, we ask, Jesus, that you invade their life right now. You can say something like this, Jesus, I know what you did for me. Give me the faith to trust in you more. I believe the message of the cross. And I ask that you save me. I ask that you save me. Be my Lord today. Come into my heart. Change me forever. We thank you, Jesus, for your free gift of salvation, for your love on the cross, for your resurrection, proving that you're stronger than death. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer today, congratulations. You're part of the greatest family that the world has ever known. And we are grateful for you. Go tell, in three, go tell three friends so that the enemy doesn't try to steal that truth from you, that you're new and a new person and a new creation. Bless you all. Have a great Sunday.